Hello, and welcome to another edition of the podcast Why Parliament Works with my guest today, Dame Eleanor Lang. Dame Eleanor is the Chairman of Ways and Means, which is another way of saying the Senior Deputy Speaker, a post that Eleanor was elected to last year um, in the new parliamentary session. But Dame Eleanor has had a very distinguished parliamentary career, getting into the House in 1997 um, with an intake of 120 women, the largest number of women up until that point ever elected, and that was a very important moment in British political life. Dame Eleanor, what did it feel like to be amongst that huge new intake of women and seeing Parliament change fundamentally uh, when you got in? It did fundamentally change Parliament to have a significant number of women. I've never thought that equal numbers is what matters. What matters is a critical mass. Uh, In 1997, we didn't quite have a critical mass, but we had a huge number of women. But to be perfectly honest, uh, the thing that struck me on that very first day when I came to Parliament in 1997 was that Tony Blair had just become Prime Minister after 18 years of Conservative government, and the enormous difference was the huge Labour majority and all that that was going to mean for modernisation and for a different way of running Parliament. And part of that was the large number of women. But I must say to you that when I walked into the chamber that day for the very first time, it didn't feel like there were very many women. It felt like I was totally engulfed by men in grey suits, middle-aged men in grey suits. What, people like me? <laughs> yes. No, not like you. Uh, <laughs> but you knew Parliament well already because you'd actually, I think, been a special advisor to the leader of the House's office. So you were very much um, a, a, a native, so to speak, to the House of Commons before you were elected. You're right. I did know Parliament very well. Uh, I had spent uh, six or seven years as special advisor to John McGregor when he was in the cabinet. And that included a few years in this very office when he was Lord President of the Council and leader of the House of Commons. And that was at a very exciting time. Uh, John McGregor became Uh, leader of the House of Commons on the resignation of Geoffrey Howe in November 1990, which of course sparked the events which led to the downfall of Margaret Thatcher. And I lived through those very exciting events in this very room. Um, When I look back on comparing Parliament then in 1990 to Parliament now in 2021, there has been so much evolution, it's really quite different. And with that evolution, how much of it do you think has been good and how much of it do you think has been less good for Parliament? Where do you think the balance lies? Ah, now that is the question. Every Parliament is different from every other Parliament because it's composed of 650 different personalities. And that means that the way in which the the chemical composition of that parliament is unique to that parliament. Uh, You know, back in the 90s, which is not that long ago, uh, the thing that was so different is that not every member of parliament was a career politician. We had a lot of people who did their their public duty and served their constituency and their constituents very well coming to Parliament, but it wasn't the be-all and end-all of their lives. By evolution, we have changed that over the last 30 years so that now almost every person who is elected to this Parliament wants to have a career, as it were, in parliamentary politics. And that changes the dynamics because we have fewer people who are who are personalities. We have fewer people who are willing to speak out and and say what they believe rather than towing the party line. And we have fewer people who are their own person because they don't depend upon the patronage of the prime minister. Um, If you have 650 members of parliament, the majority of whom have a goal of becoming a minister, then that 
creates a different goal, a different attitude. One of the most obvious changes from the early 90s to now is the sitting hours. That in 1990, there were late night sittings, Parliament sat to 10 o'clock most days of the week. That's all changed and the aim to be more family friendly and of course to help encourage more women to come into Parliament. Do you think that's worked well? The change of the hours that we sit and the rhythm of when we sit and uh, working in with school holidays, etc., is an enormous change. Uh, when I was based in this room, I very rarely left it before midnight. Um, and we would be back in uh, before nine o'clock in the morning in the uh, cabinet office. And that was perfectly normal. And most members of parliament worked those long hours. Again, it is much more difficult for a woman who has children or other family responsibilities to work incredibly long hours because you simply don't get the other things done that matter in life. Many women are making representations now to say that uh, they liked some of the new methods of working which we have brought in over the last year uh, in order to uh, be able to operate through the pandemic, uh, that they want those new ways of working to continue. I'm very skeptical about that. And we have to get a balance between one's duty to parliament, constituency and family. And every member of parliament, not just women, uh, has to find that balance. For women, it can often be much more difficult, especially if you're looking after uh, young children or elderly parents. It's absolutely essential that we have a critical mass of women in this parliament, because otherwise we are not representative of the community out there that we purport to represent. Therefore, we must take into consideration the extra difficulties that women with family responsibilities have. We can't ignore it. One of the things I want to talk to you about was not just ours, but also scrutiny generally and the time spent on legislative scrutiny and the time spent on general debates. And what do you think Parliament's primary purpose is? What should we be devoting our time to? It's the duty of Parliament to hold the government to account. Now, there are many theories about how that is best done. And once again, you draw me in to make a comparison with when I worked in this office 30 years ago and how we do things now. Uh, we've already said that the enormous changes uh, in the personnel of Parliament, in the hours in which Parliament sits, and the third thing which is very, very different is that we now have timetable motions as a matter of course. Most of our colleagues who are sitting in the chamber right now would find it difficult to believe that we once worked and worked very well without timetable motions. Uh, on Monday of this week, because it was a finance bill, the House sat till quarter to 12 and people were outraged. That used to be quite normal, but then uh, the lives of members of parliament were very different and the obligations and the amount of work that members of parliament did was very different. I think we, we all do far more work now in our constituencies and looking after the, uh, the personal needs of our constituents far more than we did back then, but that's partly because of email and different ways of communicating. But coming back to timetable motions, I do feel that scrutiny could often be more thorough if we had more time to do it, but then it's important to balance uh, the need for the government to get its business and the duly elected government of the country, elected by all of the people in the United Kingdom, has a right to get its business. But the opposition, representing the minority, also has to be heard. And I so agree with you. I think that is the really difficult balance to strike. And governments need to remember 
that things change and that you came in in 1997 and spent your first 13 years in opposition, at which point you get a real appreciation of the safeguards for opposition, which perhaps sometimes parties of government forget that they may need at some future date. Absolutely. I find myself saying that in recent times to many new members who come in and say, oh, this is ridiculous and that's ridiculous. Why don't we change this? Why don't we change that? And I find myself saying over and over again, um, do remember that one day your party won't be the government. You'll be in opposition. And uh, the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, pieces of ammunition that the opposition used to have was the use of time. Uh, in my first parliament, we used to sometimes in 97, 98, uh, keep the government sitting through the night. I'm not joking. I have made speeches at four o'clock and five o'clock in the morning uh, with the sole purpose of keeping the business going in order to make life difficult for the Blair government, which had a huge majority. And I have to say, Lord President, that I don't want anyone to read those speeches in Hansard because I'm not sure that they will be as good on paper as they felt at four o'clock in the morning when I was making them. <laughs> but that when you face a very large majority against you, that's the only thing that you can do, isn't it? The only thing you can do is use time and discuss and make life a little bit difficult because you know you won't win a vote even if you win the argument. It's absolutely right. In uh, all the time that I was in the Whips office in opposition, we didn't ever win a single vote. We couldn't. The Blair government had a huge majority and they could almost do what they liked. So it was very important that but we, as the opposition then, were seen to still be doing a good job in holding the government to account because it isn't only done by votes. Uh, it is done by persuasion. It is done by shedding light on uh, facts. It's done, it's done by rhetoric in the House of Commons. Now, I'm rather worried about rhetoric in the House of Commons. I'm very worried that we are losing the feel for the good and effective parliamentary speech because so many members want to speak in every debate. And if we try to accommodate all of those members using timetable motions and using um, uh, time limits on speeches, uh, we get new members standing up with large bits of paper uh, reading from that bit of paper for two minutes and 59 seconds, taking no interventions and sitting down. That's not debate. And I hope that, uh, not just I hope that, I am determined that when the conditions uh, which we have to adhere to around the uh, pandemic uh, are finished, that we will be able to get back to proper working of our precious chamber of the House of Commons, which is one of the great debating chambers in the world. Well, it won't surprise you to know that I completely agree with you. <laughs> I, I think three minute red speeches down the wire on Zoom are not a proper debate and nobody takes any notice of what anybody else has said. So there's no degree of responsiveness. And when I was a backbencher, if we were down to the very short time limits, I often pulled out of speaking and looked for things like the finance bill that weren't time limited when you knew you could have a little bit more time to cover an issue in, in the round. And I think we do need to get back to five to ten minute speeches rather than three and four minute speeches. We certainly do. But then there's a balance to be gained there. I found myself saying from the chair at one point last week, and this did amuse some people on Twitter, uh, that that which can be said in ten minutes can usually be said rather more effectively in five minutes. And here it does depend on whether it's a debate or not, because 10 minutes with four or five interventions is a proper debating it speech. Is. It is. 10 minutes read out, we well, might as well watch paint dry. It's not, it's not what a debating chamber is about. Absolutely right. And uh, I, I sympathise with the position of members who were elected in 2019 and have never really seen our chamber working properly. And there are, there are something like 150 members in that 
position. And I sincerely hope that when we can get back to normal, they will find the excitement of debate, the intensity of debate, and the importance of properly constructed intellectual argument to be rather more beneficial to their role as a member of parliament and as a legislator than their right to speak in every debate. I, I mean, I agree with that. I think, again, it's, it's a balance and that actually if you know you will be able to make a full argument in one debate, that is better than just being a formal appearance in a number of debates. Absolutely you know. it is. But you have a fantastic style in the chat. And you mentioned that you said what can be said in 10 minutes can be said just well in three. But you also beautifully expressed the point that people sitting at home banging on forever <laughs> uh, weren't necessarily contributing hugely to the debate. And you have a, a firmness and charm that keeps the House in order. What I want to ask about particularly is you've done two budgets, one full budget and with everybody there and one with limited numbers there. How did you prepare for that and what were you expecting and what did you get? Well, the first time I chaired the budget it, it, was, it was quite exciting and I, I found it, it, it was one of the greatest challenges that I have taken on in my professional career and uh, at that day the house was absolutely packed and I was, uh, I was ready for all sorts of things to happen because sometimes, uh, not surprisingly, our colleagues think that uh, doing something slightly outrageous during the budget debate will get them noticed and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the, that's the stuff of politics and their play to the cameras, etc. In fact, it was a little disappointing because everyone was quite well behaved. <laughs> so, um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't terribly difficult, but it can be difficult to control the house when it is, it's getting very heated. Uh, of course, by the time I chaired my first budget, uh, we had gone through all of the Brexit debates. Mm -hmm. That was the time when it was difficult to control the house. And one of the reasons it was so difficult in those days to control the House, and I did on many occasions, because occasionally Speaker Burko did vacate the chair, only occasionally, but he did <laughs> occasionally vacate the chair. And so I found myself sometimes in a situation where um, it was difficult to work out who was opposing whom and who had a right to speak and how to balance it because one of the things you must do from the chair is to make sure that both sides of the argument are heard. Now, usually that means that you balance this side of the house with that side of the house, but of course in a debate like the Brexit debates that didn't happen because the opposition were on that side and on that side and that did make it much more interesting and challenging and I think the way to do it is not to be like a school mom and certainly not, certainly not to embarrass people or to criticise a member uh, unnecessarily, but to exert authority with kindness and I hope with dignity. Well, I think that's very important because I think it's very easy for whoever is in the speaker's chair to forget what a powerful position that is and how small somebody feels if aggressively corrected from the chair. And I think doing it with kindliness and gentleness, because we all make mistakes in the chamber. We do. And occasionally say you when, I mean, <laughs> I, I know that one isn't meant to, but I must confess I have once or twice just accidentally said you rather than speaking properly through the speaker. Uh, and the, the gentleness of correction is, is I think, very important to encouraging particularly new members to, to speak, because it is an extraordinary chamber, isn't it? And oh, you were saying so. your speeches at four o'clock in the morning you don't want to read, but every word you said is taken down, is in Hansard and is recorded for posterity. Absolutely. Every word you say in the chamber is recorded, even the silly words, the wrong words. And of course, uh, it's the duty of the chair to make sure that any words that are not allowed in parliamentary language are not repeated in the chamber. 
Um, but people are quite well behaved right now. And there's a lot of work that goes into preparing for the chamber, isn't there? Because particularly at the moment, with so many people applying to speak, you've got to draw up the speaking lists, you've got to discuss with the speaker the urgent questions and the business that will come forward that is under your purview rather than that of the, of the government. So it's not all about sitting in the chair and, and keeping elegant order. It's also about the work that goes in before, a lot of which I understand falls on the Chairman of Ways and Means. You're absolutely right. People imagine that the job of being Deputy Speaker is that part of the job which can be seen when one is sitting in the chair. But as with any other job or profession, it is, of course, the tip of the iceberg. And most of the work is done when one is not in the chair, but uh, in preparation for what happens in the chamber. Um, to an extent, it's a bit like stage management. We have to work out uh, what has to be done in a particular day. A normal day lasts usually eight hours, although of course it can go on a lot longer than that, but it's normally eight hours. We have to have that eight hours divided up into its component parts, and we have to make sure that every piece of business is given its due time and attention, and that everyone who is going to speak that day uh, has due time and space to do so. And that is not easy. In normal circumstances, uh, there's a certain amount of discretion that can be applied. In normal circumstances, when you're in the chair, you are in control. Uh, and you can, it's, a lot of it is done by instinct. You're sitting there in the chair and you can feel the way in which the chamber is operating. You read the chamber. It's something I learned long, long ago when I worked for John McGregor when he was uh, leader of the house. He could read the chamber. I'm not saying I could do it then, but I learned how important it was to get a feel for what was happening. And it's impossible to explain because so much of it is from instinct, which develops over many, many years of experience and of understanding your colleagues and understanding the way in which the chamber works. Uh, and, and therefore, um, controlling the chamber is done partly by instinct and partly by planning, because you can't use your instinct unless you have the parameters properly in place within which it operates. And the mood of the chamber can change incredibly quickly, can't yes, it? it? Can. That one moment, you see this very often at Prime Minister's questions, it is the most politically contentious issue. The house is full and people are getting hammer and tongs to each other. Yes. And then somebody gets up and talks about um, a death in his or her constituency and you can hear a pin drop and the whole atmosphere has changed. And uh, from the chair, you must first of all see that very clearly but also you've got to make sure that your ordering of the house matches the mood of the house. It needs a great sensitivity. Absolutely right. And it can change in an instant because we can move from highly contentious party political business to, as you say, um, a, a, a 10 minute rule bill or a point of order or a personal statement which might involve something very sensitive. And one of the things that I get annoyed about is that if members are not paying attention and they've, they're making a noise which is appropriate um, in, in, uh, in causing difficulty for the other side of the house, it's appropriate to make a noise at that point. When the mood changes and we're on to the next item of business, I get very annoyed if people don't pay attention and show respect for the matter that's being dealt with. Um, yes, and it's a very difficult slot, they're not one you currently chair, um, just before Prime Minister's questions, isn't it, which can sometimes be a very serious oh, yes. department, but unfortunately as the Chamber fills up for PMQs, it doesn't always get the attention uh, that it deserves. Well, I, I remember when I was once upon a time Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, and uh, one time when I had, uh, I was standing at the dispatch box and I still had to ask my question 
of the Secretary of State for Scotland and the House the Scottish Questions comes just before Prime Minister's Questions and uh, and David Cameron came in for he was a leader of the opposition at the time. Uh, David Cameron came in and sat on one side of me. George Osborne, the shadow chancellor, came and sat on the other side of me. They literally squashed me out. <laughs> and I had to say, I can't go because I've still got to ask the question. And I got up to ask my question of the Secretary of State for Scotland. And I know perfectly well that nobody was listening at all, except perhaps my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, possibly the Secretary of State for Scotland couldn't hear it because I'm Sometimes the noise is so great. Uh, ah, no, that's the thing. I have never not been heard. There is, now, there silly is of me great, to have suggested it. <laughs> there is a great advantage in having a voice that can be heard. You have to learn to modulate it and not make it uh, too strong all of the time. But having a voice that can be heard is a great asset uh, in Parliament, especially when you're a very small woman like I am. Well, a force to be reckoned with. The first woman to become chairman of Ways and Means, uh, and you decided to remain being called chairman. You didn't want to be addressed as a piece of furniture. I did not want to be addressed as a piece of furniture. Uh, the word chairman is akin to the word president or convener. The fact that it has the letters M-A-N at the end is irrelevant. Uh, so has human, and we're not called Hughes. That is a brilliant answer, I think, on which to end. Eleanor, thank you so much. Um, I suppose I ought to add at the end, I always thought you were a brilliant um, deputy speaker before you became chairman of Ways and Means, because you always very kindly snuck me in, usually a little bit earlier than I was on the list. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that was, I've always much appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, that was because you always had something interesting to say. Thank you. <laughs>